All right, what is up, guys? Coach Show here at the Casting Couch. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, guys. With a legend, Matt Wenning, okay, here in uh, Ohio. Got a really cool opportunity to train, uh, kind of pick his brain a little bit. First off, thank you yeah, man. for having us out here. That was fun. I've never done the training that he'll kind of dive into and talk about maybe a little bit of the method behind the madness. Uh, you guys will be seeing the footage as this is rolling of what we're doing. Totally different for me, man. Mm -hmm. Like, I come from... A lot of progressive overload, putting a lot of work in the main movements. Yeah. Not a ton of variation sure. compared to probably what you have done. Yeah. Uh, so maybe, one, give a little background on yourself. Yeah. Uh, and then, two, just kind of talk about maybe some things that we did today. Sure. Uh, some, some notes, some things you maybe saw with myself, the crew, some sure. pointers you were talking through. I thought there was a lot of good coaching points. Yeah, I mean, so basically what you start to realize is when I was about 17, 18 years old, I came from old school coaching people that – all they knew was linear periodization. All they knew was you want to get better at bench press, bench press. You want to get better at deadlift, you deadlift. You use a straight bar constantly. And what I started to realize by about 19 is that it got me to a 500 pound bench, but my elbows and my shoulders and my wrists, and I had a lot of like just nagging issues that a 19 year old just shouldn't have. Now, obviously all of us at 19 would have loved to have a 500 pound bench. I'm one of few guys that I knew of that's reached that level that quick. But my point was, is that I was paying for it. And unbeknownst to me, Powerlifting USA is out at the time, the old school magazine. And I see this guy, Louis Simmons, talking. And he's talking stuff in this, these articles. I had no idea what he was talking about, like getting faster to get stronger, mm -hmm. rotating exercises, reduction of mileage. And I was like, dude, these are like three. Let's just focus on these for today. Those are three major pillars that I was not thinking about, right? Like, how do I get stronger and do weird shit all the time? That doesn't make any sense. You know, how do I um, get better at... Um, getting stronger by getting faster. That didn't make any sense, right? So we had all these different areas that started to really open my brain and saying, nah, that doesn't work for me, I'm already strong. My biggest, I guess, um, trait was that I was always hungry to learn more and get better. Mm -hmm. And I had realized that whatever I had gotten, whatever had got me to the 500 pound bench, sure as fuck wasn't gonna get me to 600. Yeah. Cause I could already tell that my body was already mm -hmm. agitated by what I was doing. So that led me down the path of what you kind of see today as the final product. Fast forward, you know, 15, 20 years later, I'm a um, multiple world record holder in gear. Um, so equipped lifting for those of you who don't know that. And then I decided to be one of the first guys to go conjugate and switch raw because there was this huge controversy that conjugate system didn't work raw. And in its traditional layout, the way we had done it at Westside, they were partially right. There's a lot of different variations that you need to be good in gear versus being good raw. One of them being all you have to rely on is your muscle tissue. Mm -hmm. You don't have to rely on like elastic gear to help you lift, which is a lot more technical. So I'm, I'm in my first raw bench press meet and I hit 600 and I hit 600 pretty easy. That puts me at the time, the 15th or 16th highest bench ever done. And it was the seventh highest bench ever done as a power lifter. So that means a guy that squats too. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I, I'm looking at the totals, and it's 22.02. Dan Kovacs hit that in the 90s. And, you know, he was a legend. And I was like, I think I can take that. So I train really hard and go to my first raw competition in 2013, and I squat 788. Not really knowing that my conditioning level was poor, I go for my big 606 six bench, which 606 was the first one over 600. And it fucking staples me. Now, in training, I was really strong. But for some reason, I couldn't figure out why that 600-pound plus bench was not there, and I started to realize that driving home, because this meet was two hours away, I'm driving home, and instead of just thinking like a classical powerlifter, like, I just need to get stronger, I started thinking, man, maybe I'm not in shape enough to be stronger. And in the equipment, you could hide behind some of that, because the amount of catapult you got out of that gear, even if you were a little deconditioned, they were giving you so much power out of that equipment that... It didn't really matter. All you had to do was hold technical proficiency, and you had a yeah. great chance of getting those lifts. So I'm driving home, and I'm thinking, fuck, man, i got to figure out a better way to get stronger. And it's not going to be primarily, like, my main drive was not to get stronger. I knew I was strong enough. I just couldn't show it after yeah. squatting close to a world record. Keep in mind, that 788 squat was 35, 40 pounds behind the all-time world record. It was 826 by Scott Weech. So, you know, going to my first powerlifting meet, and I'm already the second highest squatter of all time. In, in the raw division with no, no, no wraps. So I'm driving home and I figured conditioning's a problem. And this is when winning warmups start. 
So in 2012, early 2012, before I hit the 600 pound bench, I was speaking in Australia. And there was a, there was a lady there that was studying rugby and didn't know jack shit about lifting. But she was studying pre-fatigue before they were doing their, their lifts in the, in the actual weight room for pro rugby. And she said that they were seeing all these better potentiation points, muscles were activating better. So I'm thinking, man, maybe there's something to this. Maybe if I do something that's pre-exhausting, that it will not only get my muscles activated correctly, but it'll also get me in better shape. And that's when I started to dig around. I talked to Stan Efforting and Flex Wheeler, you know, one of the top bodybuilders to ever live, and he was a huge proponent of 20s and 25s. So I started talking to him, and he was like, well, when I did 20s and 25s, it felt like the muscle got better, but I never got central nervous system fatigue. I never got, like, neurally tired. And I'm thinking, okay, well, I'll keep the reps between 20 and 25. So I just set 25. Because in my thought process, if I can do 25 reps, it can't be heavy enough to hurt a 1RM. Right. Kind of makes yeah, sense, it's right? Light, yeah. It's too light. So 25 is what forced me to keep it light enough. So back, back then, I started off with, like, 25-pound dumbbells. So I'm doing... Four sets of 25, and keep in mind this is bench only. So I'm all, I first experiment with winning warm-ups only on the bench. So fast forward after understanding to do four sets of 25, I selected, I felt my triceps were weak or needed more work. I felt my lats needed more work and my just pressing volume needed to go up. So those are the three movements I selected. So I would do a pressing movement for four sets of 25, a back movement for four sets of 25, and a tricep movement for four sets of 25. Fast forward nine months later, I go to Raw Unity in Florida I break the all-time world record in the squat, and then I bench 606 like an empty fucking bar, and I had the highest subtotal ever done under 300 pounds. It was like, like right at, uh, let's see, whatever, whatever 832 plus 606 is. So, you know, almost a 1,500-pound subtotal, mm-hmm. completely raw. This is 2014. Yeah, 2438. So, um, long story short, I was onto something, and I realized my bench was back. So now I could squat an all-time world record, and I still had that 600-pound plus bench with some in the tank. So I implemented it in 2015 with all the lifts. And then that's when my squat, I took the all-time world record from 832 to 870. So I jumped at 40 pounds. Wow. And then my bench hit 611 that meet. <laughs> so now I had the highest subtotal, almost the highest subtotal ever done in history. It was right at 1,500. Yeah. So I put 90 pounds on my total. Now keep in mind, all the rest of the training looked exactly the same. All I implemented different was the warm-ups. The volume, yeah. And I was the same body weight crazy, in, in less than a year. So that's when I realized that my general physical capacity or work capacity wasn't high enough for me to show my strength. Hmm. Which is such a, a, like to most people that's backwards, right? They think, oh, I just gotta get stronger, keep pushing the strength. I feel like I'm kind of in that point now too. And that's why I'm here, which is cool getting to train with you and pick up some of this stuff that immediately now I wanna give it a shot. And kind of like you had said, and, we can dive into our warm up. Mm-hmm. The weight's light enough where we're cranking out four, four total sets, 25 reps, and didn't affect our, our bench at all or anything no. like that. And I think, honestly, it made it feel better. Mm-hmm. Um, so, why don't you take us through kind of what we did today? It was a, a bench yeah. focused day. Yeah. We went through the, the typical winning warm up, maybe just the exercise we did, stuff you're thinking about, and then kind of our, our main benching. Sure. We did. So, the warm up was designed around what we, what we, Theorize are the are the weaknesses. Now, for you guys, we didn't know because we never trained with you. Everything. But for us, we figured we figured okay, if we're going to do a narrow grip, max effort, we're going to warm up wide, and we're going to hit more of the bottom end because the floor press is not going to touch the bottom end. So we did 100 reps of bottom end work because the max work was going to hit the middle and the top. Make sense? Yep. So everything was selected. Now the other exercises we picked for the warm up while you guys were out looking at the gym, we were selecting what we were going to do. Um, we were selecting movements that we hadn't touched in six to eight months. Now that's crazy because we do winning warm-ups twice a week for upper body. Mm-hmm. But that's how vast your library ends up having to be. And the reason for that is not only for performance gain, but also reduction of mileage. And the reduction of mileage is a huge proponent because when you reduce mileage, you feel fresher, you can train harder. Mm-hmm. So the problem with all that is, is that when you're training really hard, you have to keep away from bumps and bruises or it's gonna slow you down. So the person that actually turtles to get stronger without bumps and bruises actually gets stronger than the guy that's ramming that shit into the ground, but now he's got to back down because he's hurt. Think about total volume in a year. If I train really hard for six weeks, but then I got to back off for three or four because I get an injury, and the guy trained straight for 50 weeks with no injuries, who did more work? But we always think about, well, I got to get everything out of today. You need to learn to get everything out of 30 days, 60 days, 90 days in a year. Right? People tend to overestimate what they can get done in a session and underestimate what they can get done in five months. 
And that's the biggest problem with powerlifting and strongman and everything. They don't have a multi-year process. And one of the biggest things that was ever told to me when I was a kid was I was working out with you know a guy named Eddie Cohen, which we all know, 74 all-time world records, one of the best powerlifters to ever live. He comes to me at 20 years old. I hit my first 700-pound squat as a, as a collegiate uh, junior. And he says, dude, if you can hold on, you'll squat way over 800 in 10 years. No, he didn't tell me in six weeks. He didn't yeah, tell me in a year. Years. He told me 10 fucking years. <laughs> now, for the average person that's in what we do, they're going to be like, man, I'm not going to wait 10 fucking years. That's way too long. For me, I enjoyed training. Yeah. I enjoyed the process. I didn't give a flying shit how long it took. But that's also why I'm almost 42 now, and I'm totally fresh. My knees don't hurt. My back don't hurt. Everything's straight. Because as soon as something came wonky or I didn't didn't feel right, I just changed what I did and still created the volume around it like we were talking about. If I had a bump or a bruise in one spot, I figured out an angle that didn't hurt. And I still trained, which comes back to my other statement that I say all the time. Modify, don't miss. Mm-hmm. Right? If you modify the movements... Constantly, you're going to create constant volume. Yep. I think we have to be understanding that muscles only understand no work or work. They don't care if your central nervous system's tired. If muscles don't sense connection, they don't sense tension, and they don't sense pressure, they don't maintain or change. They regress. Mm-hmm. So that means that we have to constantly stimulate muscle tissue every 72 hours. Well, the only way to do that is to change mode if you look at a 10-year process. You can't do it the same way all the time. Yeah. Now, yes, there are a handful of guys that can, like like Milanichev that don't have any other accessories or any other things, and they train exactly the same way all the time. But you would find that the majority of the people are not wired that way, and their bodies can't withstand that amount of volume or intensity in the exact same area. They need rotation. And where I first learned this was Charles Poliquin would talk about how most coaches want to find a high serotonin athlete, not a high dopamine athlete. And what that means is a high serotonin person, brain-wise, can withstand the exact same shit all the time and they never burn out from it. But high dopamine tend to have a better ability long term to get more performance out of them, but they need more variation. So the problem is is that a lot of people that are the best in the world, they need lots of variation. But the reason you only find that the best in the world do serotonin style training is because they're the easiest to coach. Does that make sense? Yeah. So yeah. variation has a lot of great proponents. But it also has a lot of detriments. You got to be very smart to yeah. select what you want. Like you guys were asking me, like, why do this today? So you're seeing this floor press, narrow grip with five chain. Because five six weeks ago when we did a raw pause bench, we felt that the middle and the top needed more work. So now 75% of the max effort exercises we're rotating are building the middle and the top. So the point is, is we're not selecting just to select and do different shit. That's not the reason. That would be CrossFit. Yeah. Right. We select something because we are sensing a weakness and assessing what the need is on a weekly basis and then rotating those things in based on what we know in the library. Yeah, I think for, for myself, I've, I've honestly never done a kanji style program or training and my variation library is a lot smaller than what you were saying. And I do the same variations every couple times a week. You know what sure. I mean? So um, I, I think what I've thought is that Sometimes it's just too random, but kind of listening to you talk about it, it's very specific. Mm-hmm. So we did this bench, and then after the bench, we got into some accessory work. Yep. Uh, so the thought process behind that, what you guys, you, I mean, you told us obviously, but to the, the listeners, what was your thought process? Yeah. Like, how are we going to hit these these movements? Well, since so you're going to talk over this, so let's take a look. So on the triceps, we you guys almost all failed in the middle and the top, right? Or that's where it got the most hard. Now, yeah, it's 200 fucking pounds of chain, so it's going to get hard for everybody. But you guys noticed when it got hard for me, I just ground right through it. Mm-hmm. And everybody else stuck and they couldn't do it. Now, it's not because I'm used to the exercise. Remember, we talked. I haven't used that exercise in 12 year. months. Yeah. So how did that happen? Well, it's because I'm used to training multiple environments. But it also works because now, once we have a assessment, which is the core lift, which was the floor press, we saw all of you guys stick at the top. What was the first thing that we nailed? The fucking triceps. And we did stuff on a tricep with a pause. So we actually came back. Now, if you guys would have looked grinding and had great pauses and looked super smooth, we probably would have just done those throwbacks and not. But we noticed we got back here and stopped and then threw. That's to take away kinetic energy. So you notice that a couple of the guys training, when they got when it got heavy, they tried to bounce it out of the foam. They weren't going to pause it, mm-hmm. and they missed it. That's because they're used to storing kinetic energy in the tendon and not from a dead stop. Right? What's easier, a bench, a touch and go, or a pause? Touch and go. Because you store kinetic energy and you're a fucking spring, right? Mm-hmm. Take away the spring and training, and then bring it back and find out how much stronger yeah. you are. It almost gives you like that super power feeling, like you were talking about, 
after that, if we were to, you know, just go to a regular barbell, like it would have been a completely different situation. Mm -hmm. uh, so we did the triceps, and then we moved on to some back work. Yep. Got to say, the lat machine in here is one of my favorites. I've yeah. never used that machine. So that machine, because it spreads at the bottom, really hits muscles yeah. in a weird way. But you also notice, when you look at the video, that we did strong down and controlled up. Mm -hmm. The lat of um, a lot of other muscles, especially like the calf, likes to be used as a big spring, a big tendon. That's like a stored kinetic energy retriever. When you do a slow decentric, you actually force the muscle to work harder, which is no, it's a no brainer. But certain muscles really like to be used as springs. So if you look at somebody who's never been trained, when they go to do a pull up, they want to throw themselves on that pull up because they can smack that tendon and create like a slingshot effect. But if you go super slow, you're going to get more muscle development, less tendon reaction, more development, and more stiffness. Now, the reason that we use the back movement was because we saw that most guys were having trouble keeping their back tight. Yeah. So when we laid you in that foam, so people always ask me, what the hell is the foam for? And I don't answer because I'm like, fuck you. <laughs> but I'll tell you, the reason you guys just figured out why you use the foam is because it forces you, your back your can't back. lock in. Yeah. It feels like you're benching on a fucking BOSU ball, doesn't it? So when you start learning how to do that, imagine what that feels like when you go back to a solid bench press. You feel like a fucking brick. Yeah. You don't move. So I find that probably, I would say 50% of your listeners are missing a bench press because they're not tight enough to get the bench. Yeah. Remember, these muscles are not really meant to press heavy. They're meant to do small, fine-tuned motor pattern things, right? Move this here, move that here, lightweight stuff. So when you're teaching it to be kind of reverse like evolution, you're teaching it to yeah. be super strong, you have to teach those muscles how to do that in perfect technique because they're not designed to do that anymore. You know, the average Neanderthal, if you laid them down to bench press, they would kill... 99.99% of people alive. I think they said they could average bench press 500 pounds with no training. <laughs> Their levers were better built for benching. Yeah. My point is your shoulders evolved yeah. over many years to be able to do fine tune motor patterns, read, write, pick shit off trees, instead of being able to move fucking okay, boulders. Yeah, yeah. But you're reversing That's evolution crazy. process, yeah. so that means the best way to do that is to stabilize. Mm -hmm. If you can teach the body to lock in and stabilize, you can tap back into that old strength. It's kind of funny, even uh, like, when I went to bench, uh, my head was coming up, and I'm typically I never raise my head on a bench. And right away, Rob was like, "You you don't do that, do you?" And I was like, "It was just funny that he said that." I was like, "No." Like so, he he could tell right away, and it was because the foam we were on was just totally throwing me out of position. So next set, I was really trying to focus on using my back, and uh -huh. each set got progressively better, more yeah. you know, tighter, and, and the weight felt a lot better yeah. uh, as well. And that's another thing to kick in on. So let's go back to your old thought process, which I'm sure is going to change when you leave. Yeah. You got better at that movement in six to eight sets. Mm -hmm. So why the fuck would you use it for five yeah, weeks? Could, yeah. It's a waste of time. I've adapted. So the first time you read a book or the first time you do an exercise, you're going to get the most benefit out of it. Yeah. Now, what if, for the sake of saying, for the listeners and you, if your library was 15, 20, 30 exercises deep, yeah. now every time you come back to that exercise, it's a new stimulus. Therefore, you get the most gain out of it with the least amount of mileage. Now, the second week you do that floor press, you're probably going to get a little better at it. By the third week, it's a complete waste of time because you've mastered the movement. And now, you're not getting stronger, you're mastering a skill. So you got to look at, is, am I getting stronger or just better at the movement? Those are not the same. Yeah. Right? And that's where strongman, powerlifting, all have to be relative in thought, is that you want to be strong. Then specify for short periods of time what you want that strength to be, whether it's a log press or a bench press, it doesn't matter. But the key is, are you strong at all that shit? And then can you specify it down for short competitive seasons? If you're always in a competitive season, you're always training specifically, you're going to create specific mileage and you're going to have specific fucking problems. I've, I, you may know more of the literature than I do, but I knew that there was some article at some point that said, when you're really good at something, you really shouldn't train it that often because the adaptation, like you, the, the rate of growth there is going to be diminished so much. Um, and I've been thinking about that a lot with myself. And maybe we can kind of connect these points to a well, strong... Just, just, just look up law of combination. Yeah. Very yeah. simple biological law. Yeah. Using the same stimulus for too long no longer creates a, yeah. a desired result. Or you have to increase the volume, the intensity, things that in which you eventually run out of time or energy to do. So it automatically is telling you right there that you have to change the mode, which is yeah. the movement. For sure. And that's where it's a very simple biological law. If you're not changing what you're doing... You're going to have a huge problem down the road. You're going to hit sticking points, then you're going to start creating mileage issues, and then you're going to have to either get smarter or retire. Or yeah. just be content with the fact that's as strong as you're going to get. And I just posted on my Instagram yesterday or the day before 
and it was a saying that I had said probably in a conference that somebody had quoted, and it said that we it's not the fact that we don't get stronger, we don't get smart enough to get stronger. Sure, yeah. You have to start learning, yeah. right? And I was always a sponge to learn, and I was fortunate enough to learn from people that made a lot of mistakes that we talked about, yeah. right? People ask me about Louis Simmons and Chuck Vogelpool and all these other guys, these legends that I train with. I learned more of what not to do than what to do, which was still valuable. Mm -hmm. Very valuable because if you know what not to do, it's like you, it's not that you need to know who you are. You need to know who you're not. Mm -hmm. I think McConaughey did a speech I like that, that. <laughs> right? And he's yeah. a fucking weirdo. But my point is, he's he's right. If you don't, if you know who you're not, then you can start focusing on who you are. It's easier to identify that than all the options of you know yeah. who you are. You're just like, okay, I'm not this. So then you know clear cut. Yeah. Right so away. if I was lucky not to get hurt when training with those guys, but I also learned a lot of what not to do. Not not to say I didn't learn what to do. I did. But the point is, is I learned a lot of little mistakes they made along the way. And you're trying to be around for the long haul. You yeah, know? Like, dude, I'm no, I'm no good to you or him or any yeah. of the other guys you brought today if you guys can't still train with me. Exactly. I can't. Oh man, I can't. I, how many guys at my age would be that way? Yeah. That, that have been competing for 28, 30 They're years. Sitting there just. Playing, yeah, man. I'll show you what yeah. to do. But I'm, dude, I'm beat up. I tore my shoulder in 2009. I can't train with you. I fucking hung with you guys. Yeah, yeah. And I've lost 60 pounds. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, point being is like that is a coach. Uh -huh. That's someone you listen to because I didn't create mileage. I can still, you know, train with the best of them. I'm still in great shape with no injuries. And that, to me, is the – how strong you get is only one small proponent of how good your program really is. It's how strong did you get plus how much mileage did you reduce? Uh -huh. How much better do you feel as a person? Yeah, I like that a lot. How much more did you learn? Uh -huh. I, I can – take anybody and make them stronger by beating the fuck out of them yeah. but at 50 years old if they have no kneecaps left because of me i did not do a good job yeah i think especially in the industry too it's people get so caught in their ecosystem with the identity of who they are and what their training philosophy was or how they were raised in their training they stick with that mm -hmm. mindset or but, they have a short-term mindset exactly and those are the same guys that kind of just fade out mm -hmm. or like we're talking about there's the coaches that are sitting in the room all beat up pointing at the athletes instead of you know training with the athletes so I find that uh, that's super valuable. Now, last thing, uh, more practical takeaway for myself, we have a, a large powerlifting strongman audience. I'm kind of getting a lot more strongman uh, people on the channel. How could we incorporate this for maybe one of the strongman lifts with the variations? Like, so for me, my big goal is I'm, I'm pretty close to a 400 pound lock lean and press, I'm like sure. right there, but I'm kind of static with the training. So sure. maybe what are some examples of things I could do with variation and some of the principles you talked about to maybe help me kind of grow in that realm? Sure. I think no matter if you're a strongman or powerful thing, you have to know where your weaknesses are and you have to adjust at least half of your training based on your weaknesses. Mm -hmm. So don't think so specific to the ath to the to the event. Mm -hmm. Think specificity to the athlete. Okay. What does the athlete need to make him better at the sport? Not necessarily just the sporting endeavor. The other thing that I would I would consider is look at your best strongman, the most memorable strongman in the past, say, thirty years. All of them came from powerlifting, or most of them did. Zajuna mm -hmm. Savickas was a great powerlifter. Yeah. Bill Kazmaier, unbelievably strong before he touched strongman events in powerlifting. Won multiple IPF World Championships. Thor did his first powerlifting meet and hit one of the highest raw totals yeah. ever as a strongman. And if you look at his off-season training, he trains like a powerlifter. Mm -hmm. He doesn't train strongman. But when he when he walks into an event, he doesn't ha he's, he doesn't have the bumps and bruises that strongman have, and that gives him an advantage. So my thought process is is make sure that you're not training too specific. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you're focusing on things to get you better at the events without actually touching the events. And I'll put this back into a powerlifting perspective. When I squatted the all-time world record raw twice, I trained each time, so those were split between two years, I trained the actual straight bar, straight weight squat three times in a 15-week cycle. Wow. But now think about that for a second. I'm a powerlifter, and yeah. you're telling me that all I trained with was straight weight was Three times. times. I did 700 for five, then I did 775 for like triple, and then I did 840 for a double, and then walked into a meet and squatted the all time world record. And everything in between that was variable. That was the yeah. only time I squatted I was straight weight. So and I, something there. <laughs> you know, like, and I walked into the meet with no, yeah. no knee pain, no back pain, yeah. no hip pain. My point is, is that sometimes when you show up at the events, it's who's not beat up that wins. Yeah, no, it's true. And it, it makes training better too. Like, I've gone through periods, I'm sure listeners, maybe yourself, like your knees hurt, your elbows hurt all the time. That takes the motivation out of training sometimes. So if you can 
feel better in training just from a psychological standpoint the training overall is going to be a better stimulus yeah. because you're, you're not as banged up you're feeling better yeah. um, well you're not going to go like look at cars for example you're not going to go out and try to drag race somebody if you don't if you have ball tires your rear ends clicking and clacking and it's not grabbing your transmission slipping yeah. but that's what people do in powerlifting and strongman they go out and they perform i.e race and they get all these problems with their car or their body and then they wonder why they get their ass beat when the potential of their body or car is much higher but the problem is is that they're not taking care of themselves to be their best on that day and that's the problem is guys is like if you're a competitor nobody gives a fuck what you do in training they care what you do at the contest, contest yeah that's where people fuck up and that's where i think we're at a disadvantage in this particular era is that everybody trains for the instagram instead of training for the contest do you think bill kasmeyer gave a flying shit about what he did in training Hell no! He showed up to IPF Worlds and beat everybody because the only time you knew what he was doing is if he wanted to write an article in a magazine. It wasn't like, oh, I, I got to post this for Instagram today or I got to do this. That forces you to not have a long term training protocol. You're putting everything on that day and you're trying to show off every day versus show off when it matters. Yeah. Uh, that, that's a great point. I think that's a, an awesome way to kind of close this whole thing out. Um, First off, thank you, man, so much. That was a really cool experience. Yep. This entire weekend and this trip here, I've been uncomfortable. I've been sore in places I haven't been sore in, uh, but I've been learning a lot, and I've been trying to surround myself with the best people in the industry. He's so highly recommended by a lot of people that I talk to, so I'm just grateful for the opportunity to be here. And my whole, the whole time we're doing this, like he said, when I leave, my brain's already going. I'm sitting there yep. like, how can I incorporate this? Um, kind of just listening to more in depth on the why yep. and the how he's doing it. it. It's all making sense to me. Well, the best thing I ever did was when I when I used to train at Louie's place and I didn't live here. So I was in Columbus, Ohio working out. I'd drive two hours and 40 minutes back home every week. But that two hours and 40 minutes it gave me time to calculate my plan of what I just learned and how I was going to implement it into my system. Yeah, Do that for four or five years. Yeah, and, I, and I'm I kind of when you said that that my my brain like lit up and I was, I was pumped because that's how I train I train for the long haul and a lot of the guys that surround myself with they've said that and I'm like I'm down man five ten years and I want to be just like you coaching people in my forties fifties whatever have a long life um, still look good feel good and be strong where we talked a lot of guys are unlike that so I want to be kind of be a rare breed so surrounding myself with guys like him learning things in here this is an awesome gym awesome place tons of just uh, wisdom. He's always learning and growing. Like he, there's a very open-minded guy. So, once again, thank you, my man. Boom. Um, tell everybody where you're at, where they can yeah. find you. There's some pieces of equipment in here. I know a lot of gym owners. Yeah. So plug away, man. Yeah. So um, you know, Instagram is real Matt Winning. Um, so R E A L M A T T Winning. Um, we do a lot of stuff on the website. So WinningStrength.com. Uh, that's where you can find the belt squat machine. You can find the tricep machine, yeah. the good morning machine. We're selling those like crazy because you're finding it today's age of competitive like equipment building. People are trying to find a cheaper way to make something, yeah. which is horseshit. So our stuff's made to last literally generations. And anybody that's ever worked out on our stuff knows. So, um, you know, we make custom bench presses, belt squats, good morning machines, fat bars, all kinds of shit. You can go on there and check it out. We do a lot of online coaching. So that's on the website. We have probably the most experienced online coaches in the country. Can't name names because it's an NCAA violation, but we have one of the top Olympic track coaches in the country on online coaching. We have one of the first strength conditioning coaches from the MAC back from the 80s on there nice. that played for the Dolphins and the Bengals. He was a 4640 guy at 280 in 1982. So if you want to know how to get faster, <laughs> he probably yeah. knows how to yeah, do yeah. it. And he played he got into the pros from a D three school. I mean, yeah, I was in the Mac that's work. for college, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah that's D three. And then the two player. other guys have been interns with me for a long time, and one of them's another strength coach at a big Division one school. Um, so we have over a hundred and something years of experience with online coaching, and our stuff's real time. So if you send us a video yeah. on what to do, we we see it within two to four hours, give you the feedback, and adjust the workouts accordingly, yep. just like we'd be standing there. So it's a great avenue for people that are in a small town or maybe have to train out of their garage and they, they want access to elite coaching, but they just don't they don't live in an area yep. where that's capable. Um, we have the Patreon channel, which cool. we strongly encourage everybody to get on, like, like my, my Instagram and all that.